Welcome to the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast. It is Thursday, February 18th. Derek Van Riper and Michael Beller here with you with a special guest from USA Today, the Grand Puba of the Labor <laughs> Leagues. We had the mixed labor draft go down earlier this week. He is Steve Gardner. He's one of my favorite people in this industry and one of the nicest people in this industry as well. Steve, how's it going for you? I'm going great, Derek, and uh, thank you for that intro. It's it's fantasy baseball season. We've got pitchers and catchers reporting. Uh, I'm I'm just totally stoked right now. And we're recording this just the morning after Fernando Tatis Jr. got a 14-year extension with the Padres, which gives me just a glimmer of hope, right? (laughs) If if the Padres are going to spend that much money on any player, other teams can do it too, right? There's hope for the league as a whole, perhaps, that the young stars this game will get paid. Uh, So the mixed league labor format is a 15 team mixed league. It's a snake draft just to kind of set the stage for anybody who's not familiar with the league. And you're the 12th pick this year. My first question for you is in terms of where you actually want to be in the draft order. Did you get a spot that you feel good about? I mean, what's your priority position? If you get to choose any spot in the order this year, where do you actually want to be given the unique shape of the 2021 board? I don't know. I think this is probably one of in a 15 team league at 12 is probably one of the worst because you want to be, I think no matter what size your league, there are five elite hitters and a couple of elite pitchers. So you want to get one of those guys to be your cornerstone. And then after that, you know, there are advantages to being on the wheel because you can get two really, really good guys. I think somewhere in that, you know, eight to 13, is just a, a no man's land where you never know what you can plan for uh, as the draft starts and you just have to read and react. And that's kind of what I, what I tried to do once the first round and, and second round, you know, uh, arrived. Well, let's take a look at that uh, section of the draft in this uh, labor mix that you just did. You actually had Trey Turner from Stefania Bell jump up into the sixth spot. So that pushed the two pitchers, Jacob DeGrom and Garrett Cole, down a spot to seven and eight. Nine was Jose Ramirez, 10 Shane Bieber, 11 Trevor Story. And then you come in at the 12 spot with Christian Yelich. Uh, The next hitters off the board behind you taking Yelich were uh, Cody Bellinger, Francisco Lindor, Freddie Freeman. Why Yelich over those three guys? Well, I just think you look at last season and uh, going into spring training, Christian Yelich was the number one overall player on a lot of people's boards, including mine. And, you know, you had a guy who's, you know, an MVP contributes in all the categories and just his prices or his value has been bumped down because of what happened last year in a 60 game span. And, uh, you know, a lot of those things were anomalous that happened last year and uh, can be explained a lot of the guys that slumped by just one simple thing that didn't go well for them, didn't go right for them. And Christian Yelich, I thought was in that, uh, you know, that category and a great value there. I figured that either story or Yelich would fall to me and that would be okay. I'd be happy to start that way. And sure enough, he was there and, you know, you can't really ask for, if if you want to take Ronald Acuna or, you know, uh, Mike Trout or somebody at the, or at the beginning of the draft and you want those five categories, Christian Yelich gives you the exact same thing, but it came at pick 12. Yeah, I think the other thing people maybe have lost sight of with Yelich was just how his 2019 season ended, right? He followed a ball off his own leg, had that knee injury that ended his season. He never quite looked comfortable in the shortened season, even though he was healthy, even when spring training stopped in March, he looked just unsure of things in the batter's box. He looked unsure, even defensively at times, took some bizarre routes in the outfield, just did some things that Christian Yelich hadn't really done in a Brewers uniform in those great 2018, 2019 seasons. Steve, just like you, I had Christian Yelich number one on my board, not because I'm a Brewers fan. People watching us on YouTube see the big <laughs> ball and glove logo on my hat right now. Of course uh, it's a Brewers guy. <laughs> he's a legitimate five tool guy still at this stage of his career. Even if he bounces back to like a 15 steel sort of level in the speed department, he'll absolutely take that in the first round. I think the power comes all the way back. The stat cast numbers were still good last year. And even though the K rate jumped, the walk rate was still there too. So I think he's one of the reasons I like being later in the round. For me, I'm almost more like five, four, three, two, one. Maybe, maybe I drop down to six or seven, even depending on who I'm going against and their tendencies. And then I want to drop, drop back to the other end, like 15, 14, 13, 12, 
uh, because I, I do think you get Yelich and even Bellinger. I mean, if, the, if, if his shoulder's healthy, he's an early first rounder for us 12 months ago. I don't think a whole lot has changed, and he's still a little bit younger than people realize, too. Uh, the other key question early is your approach with starting pitching. You end up getting you Darvish with that second pick in round two, and you end up getting your next pitcher, Max Freed, down in round five. So you didn't go over aggressive with pitching. I think you kind of went more middle of the road. This is a pretty typical sort of build. <laughs> we saw a couple teams go pocket aces. Jeff Erickson went Cole and Giolito. So Cole from the eighth pick and then Giolito on the way back through. And Dr. Roto went Shane Bieber and Walker Bueller from the 10 spot. Have you thought through the pocket aces strategy and decided it just is too much allocated into pitching? Is it a strategy you would consider in certain instances? Uh, what kind of guided your, your process as far as going with just two pitchers in the first five rounds instead of like two in the first three or two in the first four. Yeah. I just, I like to have some sort of offensive base really early in the draft. And I don't think, well, you know, it could certainly work for, for either of those guys that went pocket aces in the first two rounds and, uh, and they're good enough to pull that off. I don't know if, if I feel comfortable enough doing that. And so I, I like the one hitter, one pitcher, uh, especially toward the back of the round, to you know to to pro provide me a real solid base because it takes a long time for that to come back around to you in the third round um although i have to say with jeff uh lucas giolito getting that to you know getting him in his spot i might have considered it because i was torn between darvish and giolito uh with my pick in the second round and then nola went off the board bueller went off the board castillo went off the board and giolito was a pretty, pretty good bargain there. So uh, that's where I might consider it. You have to be flexible and, and kind of read and react to the room. And, uh, and I think Jeff did a good job with that. Uh, not to knock down uh, Dr. Roto, taking Bieber and Bueller is a pretty good start too. But I think Jeff especially got some great value with Cole and Giolito as his top two. Well, that takes us right into the next spot that I want to go here, Steve. Uh, you take you, Darvish, at the start of what was a five-pitcher run in a row. Darvish, Nola, Bueller, Castillo, and then Giolito. Then you get Eloy Jimenez. Two more pitchers come off right after that. Max Scherzer, Jack Flaherty, and then another pitcher, Clayton Kershaw, right at the end of the second round. So you had five pitchers in a row, seven out of eight, and eight out of 11 picks. And you really had your pick. So why was it Darvish over the other guys? I just think that the gains that he made in terms of his control last year and, and started a little bit in 2019, you know, he was so wild and then all of a sudden, whatever he did, he found it and that control, the walks just zipped down to virtually none. I think that was a huge move, uh, a conscious move on his part. You know, we look at stats and try and determine things, but you don't know when somebody does something that specifically impacts what his performance is going to be from that point forward. I think Darvish is one of those stories. And um, we know he's got the stamina and stability to pitch a lot of innings, which is going to be very important for selecting pitchers this season. And the strikeout rate is, is great. So you have the innings plus the strikeout rate. I think he's a great foundation. And, and that's why I have him behind the, the big four uh, of DeGrom, Cole, and Bieber and Bauer. Yeah, I mean, I think with Darvish, just getting that walk rate down as much as he did in the second half of 2019, carrying that through the shortened season, that's really changed a lot about how I view his profile. And going to San Diego, too, he goes from you know one pitcher-friendly environment to another one, goes to a team that's trying very hard to win. So <laughs> makes me yes. feel a little better about the win probability on Darvish's starts as well. I think the, the general takeaway, too, if you're picking in the early part of round two and you're going to go hitter first, have your preferences clearly mapped out from that group. Because right. if you're looking at all of those guys and you're deciding in one minute, it becomes a really difficult decision to make. As you said, Darvish versus Giolito is a legitimate argument. I think Bueller might be the guy that I take in that spot, but there's not much separating anybody within that group. Back-to-back uh, -back hitters for you in three and four, as we sort of touched on a little bit earlier, Corey Seager and Marcelo Zuna. I like both of those guys because I think you get a really nice batting average floor. You get great run production, obviously plenty of power. Zuna might be a little underrated in our community as an early rounder, even after uh, putting up some pretty big numbers each of these last two seasons. Now, are you concerned that you don't have enough speed in your base? We've talked about Yelich at least getting you probably mid-range, like double digits, like 15 or so 
Seager and Ozuna are two guys I don't really see running much at all. How do you feel about speed in this foundation? Is that your, your main categorical flaw? Yeah, you're, you're reading my mindset from when I was in the draft room from the other night because, you know, while I love the production, run scored, RBIs, the power with Marcelo Zuna in there, I was thinking in the back of my mind, okay, I'm going to have to address speed later. And as, as we will see as we go through some of these <laughs> picks later on, um, I may have overreacted to the need for speed a little bit. And, uh, you know, as will happen in a room full of, 14 other teams that are all, you know, on the top of their game, you can't get what you want always. I uh, think I got that little reverse from the lyrics, so I don't get to <laughs> get penalized for copyright violations. <laughs> but, um, Good save. <laughs> but, you know, that, that's something that, that plays in your mind. You've got to be thinking about all the different things and all the different areas that you want to address. And, you know, something is going, you're going to come out short is basically what's going to happen in a 15 team league. I mean, I literally had this exact same problem in the fourth round of a draft a few weeks ago. I took Aaron judge in a similar position to where you were, got the big power, got the run production, a little less batting average floor than, than Marcelo Zuna. If I'm just being completely honest about what I did and I passed on Randy or Rosarena. And that was a decision that, that you had as well. Rosarena was on the board. Luis Robert was on the board. I mean, Trent Grisham runs a little, he was still out there too. You could have went into a different position, I guess. And, maybe chase Kevin Biggio, but then you're taking on a lot of batting average risk early on mm -hmm. of those guys who went later in the round, who do run, who is the, the closest to actually being your choice over Ozuna? Oh, I made a note down too. When I was drafting, it was Ozuna and Luis Robert. Those were the two guys. And the, the question was, you know, I thought I had some speed with Yelich. Do I wanted to go all in with a young unproven and a guy who slumped at the end of last year in Luis Robert, you know, the, the talent ceiling is there, or do I want to go with the safer kind of guy in Marcelo Zuna with the, the locked in power that we know will get, uh, you know, production from him. That was the choice I had. And Ozuna was the choice I made, but certainly Robert was, was one a in terms of uh, my selections and, and possibilities there. Well, you know, let's stick on this uh, question of speed for a second here, because I, I want to give credit where credit's due. First place I saw this was, I want to say it was two seasons ago. It might have been just before last season, but it was from uh, our buddy Michael Salfino talking about uh, the inverse relationship of supply and demand in the fantasy world, right? We're not talking about a real world commodity when we're talking about stolen bases. And so supply and demand doesn't necessarily work uh, the way that intuitively you would think it does. And I actually just saw Chris Liss write a similar thing a couple of days ago. Uh, as the supply of something goes down in our world, the demand for it can go down as well because you need a lower threshold to compete in steals. And so I sort of see a, a an emphasis on trying to get speed early in drafts as maybe an over rotation toward uh, the, the thought of a, a typical supply demand curve. And I think that we can maybe get away with it a little bit here. And I think that starting off with a guy like Christian Yelich who uh, can run a little bit uh, is going to give you enough of a foundation. So that's something that I think you think about a little bit. We'll see what the Jose Altuve does uh, in terms of stealing bases, a guy you got a little bit later, but someone who I do want to look at that you grabbed is uh, Travis Darno. And uh, Travis Darno really did have a breakout 2020 campaign. I actually uh, had a little chat with David O'Brien, our Braves beat writer, a couple of days ago for Fantasy Baseball in 15, another one of our podcasts here. And he is all in on Darno uh, being the sort of guy who can carry over what he did in 2020 into 2021. Talked about going back to 2019 when Darno was with the Rays and reuniting with his previous minor league hitting coach. And that's when you really started to see him turn toward the guy who he looked like he could have been with the Mets so many years ago. Uh, how much of you going in on Darno was just catcher specific and how much of it was a belief that what we saw last year is the guy who he can be this season too? It was a, a little of both. And, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in Darno and uh, had him on a couple of teams last year was very happy with the results, obviously. And he's one of those guys, I think when you have your tiers of catchers and obviously Real Muto is number one, but then that kind of uh, morass of, of tier two catchers with Salvador Perez, Will Smith, Travis Darno, I think those three could be roughly interchangeable. And when you need a catcher, and I, I think we were, you know, by that time in round number nine, I, I had the decision between, 
do I address catcher? Because I think Yasmani Grandal went off the board. Christian Vas, oh yeah, Yasmani Grandal went off the board, and Wilson Contreras also went off the board, mm-hmm. and Darno was still there. And I'm thinking, okay, if I don't get him here, then I'm not going to get him, and I may have to end up, you know, punting catchers, both of them, later on. So the thought was, I'll grab a positive offensive guy here and address that because I like him. And because I think what he can do, you know, or what he has shown is sustainable. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really like him from an offensive standpoint in a year where we may have what six, seven, maybe eight catchers return actual absolute positive <laughs> fantasy value this season. Mm-hmm. Ugly. Yeah. Gary Sanchez is the guy that's part of that group for me. That's not necessarily a part of that group for everybody where <laughs> I could see him getting back to 230 and and swatting 30 home runs and having good run production again. I think the fact that he's had two seasons now below the Mendoza line is scaring a lot of people off. The K rate jumped in the shortened season. What's your trust level with Gary Sanchez? Am I right to believe that there could be a a cheaper version of, of Sal Perez lurking there in the mid rounds? It's possible. And I think the thing is, too, is you look for guys who are outliers, who can give you value that other players can't, especially at catcher. And Gary Sanchez, we know, has power, maybe the best power of any catcher in all of baseball right now. You know, Derek, in the in the uh, the XFL draft that we had, I went to fifteen dollars on (laughs) Gary Sanchez. Mm -hmm. And because I think, you know, he has that kind of value and all he has to do is just start the season with with a decent you know start decent batting average i think confidence plays an awfully big role you know in his ability to produce and you you just didn't see a whole lot of that from him either at the plate or behind it in, over the last couple of years let's take a look at steven strasburg someone who you selected in the sixth round the third starting pitcher for your team, making him uh, the third guy behind you, Darvish and Max Freed. And we're getting a little bit of a discount in. I think we can still call these early drafts, right? Maybe not super early for us. And industry drafts have to happen when they happen for various reasons. So we can have podcasts like this just being uh, being one of them. But, uh, you know, when most people are going to be sitting down to draft, even like my home league, we're not having our, our, our auction till March 30th. So most people are going to be doing this a month from now, five, six weeks from now. Right now, there is a discount on Steven Strasburg that might not exist when people are really sitting down to draft in earnest. I mean, do you think that that is something that we have to plan for? And let's say it does happen. Are you as in on Steven Strasburg a round or two earlier as you were in this draft? I think so. Uh, and because, you know, the, the carpal tunnel issue or whatever that nerve uh, thing was that he was dealing with last year, they identified it very quickly. You know, he did did not pitch hardly at all in the 2020 season. So he got treatment, uh, has the off season to rest, had basically the entire season to rest. And now he's coming back fresh. I think, you know, this is one of the, having dealt with a little bit of carpal tunnel issues myself, the one thing you can do, I mean, you can ice it or whatever, but you have to take time off. You have to rest. And that's exactly what he has done. Um, we don't know if it may pop up, you know, uh, unannounced at some point mm-hmm. during the season. But given that it was the sixth round and Steven Strasburg was a guy that was what last year's draft, what borderline second round, third round after everything that he did right. during the Nationals World Series winning season. This is still the same guy who knows how to pitch, can do the same things. He's not gotten old or anything, you know, to where his skills are diminished that we can tell. I think it's the perfect time with all the safety that I had built in to the my, to my roster in the first five rounds to go ahead and, and go out on a limb, maybe. If Steven Strasburg is there, go ahead and grab him. I mean, the guys around Kyle Hendricks, very safe. Zach Plesak. You know, you can, uh, I think he's very polarizing in drafts this year. Mm -hmm. I think Strasburg, that's the sweet spot for him right there. Yeah. I mean, I'm Strasburg over Plesak every single time, maybe easily one time out of 10, I would (laughs) take Plesak just to (laughs) offset a little injury risk. I mean, Steven Strasburg has above average injury risk, but in the sixth round, especially 
I think you can argue him talent wise up into that tier of second round pitchers still. I think he could still Definitely. finish with the likes of Darvish, Nola, Bueller, Castillo, and Giolito. So to get that as your third starting pitcher, I think that's huge. Or you basically have three potential aces, depending on how things play out with Max Freed. And Freed's a guy that I've had some difficult times figuring out in the last year or so. I I got him, I want to say two years ago in the NL labor auction. It was a deep enough league where I just thought, hey, he's going to get innings. He's going to get me Ks. The ratios might not be good, but it won't matter because it'll only be a couple of bucks. Since then, I have been skeptical that he could continue to maintain the ratios that we've seen over these last two seasons. What is it about Freed that gives you confidence that he can continue to deliver value at this new price? Well, I just think, you know, the team context with the Braves being as as good as they are, the defense being very solid there in Atlanta, and the fact that he's still young, he's still got some, I think, to improve and get even better. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I just think that, that, that is, you know, he is one of those guys, those young pitchers that, that we see every year kind of take incremental steps forward and he's going to continue on that track for me. And, you know, whatever, you know, strikeout rate, maybe if it's, if it's down a little bit, uh, from some of the others that I might've gotten in that round, still he's, he's been pretty darn consistent and the Braves have been pretty darn consistent to the point where, I'm certainly very happy to take him there and, and have him as my SP2. Max Freed among the league leaders last season in both limiting hard hit balls and uh, inducing soft contact right there with the guy who went one pick after him, uh, Hunjin Ryu, the, the two guys who just have you know made an art out of limiting hard contact. And that is a very important thing for pitchers to do. One that doesn't necessarily translate as perfectly to the fantasy game in terms of value produced in fantasy versus value produced in real life, the way that strikeouts do, but uh, Max Fried, a very interesting guy, I think, uh, to look at in that vein this season. Jumping a few rounds down, I mean, I got to ask you about this one, Steve. This is one that jumped off the charts at me when I was looking at these draft results. Eighth round, you go with Alec Bohm, and you take him ahead of a couple of established third basemen in our mind, a couple of guys who have been much higher in drafts in previous seasons, Chris Bryant go, went, what, one, two, three, four picks later. And then right. about six picks after that, you see Matt Chapman coming off the board. So Boehm over Bryant and Chapman, explain yourself and don't be too intimidated by that Cubs drawing <laughs> over my left shoulder there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. And this was the one, you know, if, if I had to you know, go back and look and say, which pick were you a little bit iffy on, um, that was that was probably the one because I, I third base has been a really difficult position for me to fill in some of the mock drafts that we've done mm. so far this season. You know, do you pay the 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 big price, the premium for the Bregmans, Machados, Devers, those guys, or do you wait it out and you don't really know what to expect from Chris Bryant? You know, Matt Chapman was hurt last year, so can he bounce back? Um, and there were a lot of question marks. Boom there for me is it just seemed like the right time. I have him ranked ahead of both Bryant and Chapman. Um, and, you know, the powers there hit for a pretty, pretty good average, which, you know, Bryant and, and Chapman have not the, the last couple of years. The, the problem with that, though, is the guy that I didn't take that I kind of wish I had. And let me make sure that, uh, that he was. Yeah. Giancarlo <laughs> Stanton would have been a fabulous pick there. And I could have waited again on third base. Um, so I know you're asking about Bohm and, and the rest of those third basemen, but what keeps replaying in my mind is Giancarlo Stanton was there and I could have just hammered the power. Uh, I think Bohm's going to hit for a decent amount of power, good ballpark and all of that. But that was the one pick maybe that I'm kind of questioning myself after the fact, should I have made that pick there and continued to wait on third base or go ahead and take a guy who's on the way again. I think a guy who's on the way up and with the solid, you know, base that I had in the first few rounds, I could go ahead and, and kind of take some of those chances in the, the middle to later rounds. You know, a lot of people think of building a roster as similar to building a portfolio. You're trying to mix varying levels of risk and, and growth potential together. And I wonder how much the pick of Jose Altuve in the seventh, maybe in the moment, pushed you to go younger with that next pick because going El Tuve Stanton, you know, you, you're going a lot older in back-to-back yeah. -back picks. And 
I, I, that's always on my mind, at least. Like, how much do you think about the type of player you're getting, whether that be a high-risk injury guy or a young player or an established veteran? How much is that on your mind as you're sort of building out a roster? Great question, because I don't think it's in your conscious mind as much as it is, as it is in your subconscious because, you know, as we're trying to make our mental calculations and everything, there's still the feel of the draft. You know, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but that's what it is for me is there's the analytical part of the draft as it's going on. And then there's the, the feel part of it. And yeah, I think as a, as a Libra, you know, I, I look for balance, whether I'm thinking about it or not thinking about it. And yeah, so my teams generally, when I'm drafting, I'm not going to be a stars and scrubs person. I'm not going to punt a category. I'm going to look for the most balanced roster that I can find. And I think that's part of it. And, uh, you know, for, for every Jose Altuve that had a horrible season last year, um, you know, maybe I, I kind of pivot to a younger guy who had a very good season. And, uh, and I think that's part of it. As, as you're looking at your roster, you're looking at the holes, the positions that you need to fill. And there's, you know, there's that subconscious component to it that certainly plays into it. And especially when, as we had a 45 second clock instead of a minute to make your picks, <laughs> those things come at you pretty fast and you've got to make those split second decisions. If anyone was going to accuse you of punting a category here, it would probably be saves. And we're coming around into round 11. Yeah. At this point, you've got three starters. You don't have any relievers. And then you go uh, reliever, reliever, back-to-back in 11 and 12 with Alex Colome and Devin Williams. Is this something that coming around to you in 11, you were thinking, I got to get two relievers here? Or did Colome and Williams just present themselves as good picks regardless of their position? Interesting. This is a uh, draft dynamics is, is what was in play here. I, I was looking at possibly where my team was weak. And obviously with no closers, no relief pitchers on the board yet, as we get into that to an 11th round and Alex Colome, I mean, fantastic year last year, mm -hmm. going to another very good team in Minnesota. So he's kind of standing out on my board of, of relief pitchers. Craig Kimbrell had just gone, in fact, right before me. And so I was like, okay, it's time to address it. I, I figure Colome, I can, I can take him. And then when it comes back around, you know, there are three, three people picking behind me. And then the round comes back. I could pick up, you know, I could pick up Williams uh, or um, no, T Taylor Rogers and kind of book in the twin saves and then go speculating. You know, that was, that's the one thing about getting a lockdown closer. There aren't very many of them this year. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you have three, four that you're comfortable taking and saying, okay, they're going to be their team's closer for the rest of the season. I figured that, you know, maybe I could just lock down both twins guys that are going to pitch in the late innings and I'd be in good shape. But yeah, then Joe Sheehan comes in and snags Taylor Rogers two picks later. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, still in this particular, you know, atmosphere, we're drafting early. We don't really know exactly how a lot of the bullpens are going to crystallize. Mm -hmm. My thought then to pivot to a guy who will give you excellent ratios, could possibly run into some saves and strike out a ton of guys. That guy for me is Nick Anderson. <laughs> I was going to ask if Joe sniped you twice. Joe sniped me a second time coming back. And I'm like, what in the heck are you doing? So, and, and here again, here's the mental dynamics that happens during a draft. And I, I think we, we downplay these uh, more than we should because it affects exactly how, you know, how can you make that pick? Well, I don't know is, is <laughs> right. the answer. My point, my problem there was my backup pick that I was sure I was going to get was suddenly off the board and there are two picks left to go until I'm up. And the best I could come up with, okay, I'm looking at these closers, all these available closers. Well, Devin Williams is pretty much what Nick Anderson was mm -hmm. the year before. So, you know, possibly some sh a shot at saves in Milwaukee if Josh Hader needs a day off. So I went ahead and followed through with that plan, got a second reliever. And that's how I ended up with Williams.
there are plenty of unsettled closer situations in the league. I mean, you actually have access. You cover baseball and get to speak to managers and players uh, at a distance right now, of course, given the nature of yeah. coverage at the present time. But do you really get the sense that teams are going to mix and match with their bullpens as much as it appears today as spring training is getting started? Because it seems like more teams than ever are willing to go with the committee approach, using their best relievers in the highest leverage spots. And it turns into like the running back by committee situation that we've dealt with for a few years now in fantasy football. Uh, thinking about the reality of that and, and looking for situations you're interested in, I mean, are you finding that there are several teams with unsettled situations that you actually believe could split saves over two or more relievers? I really do. And I think the the one thing is, you have to convince the relievers, if you're the manager, that this is something that is good, it's acceptable, and uh, it's it's for the good of the team. And because you know we don't have as many established closers, you know, with a capital C anymore, mm -hmm. and we don't have the guys that have been established like the Craig Kimbrels and the Kenley Jansons, you see these guys when they come up. Sometimes they get some save chances when they're just starting out, sometimes they grow into the closer. Sometimes they're a closer by default because the regular closer gets hurt. I think once, you know, the relievers themselves have the mentality of, okay, I might get the call here. I might not. It doesn't reflect the value that I have to this team. And I think when you get managers you know, specifically like a Rocco Baldelli or somebody like that, who can communicate these things to their players, I think that's where the trend starts, you know, it, making it acceptable again to to be a guy who comes in, gets some saves, doesn't the next time, and 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 makes it a committee not such a bad word as it as it has been for you know a pretty long time now. Yeah, you know, I think another guy who can do that and who's going to have the first opportunity in his managerial career to do that this season is David Bell with Rice Iglesias. Being shipped out to L.A., obviously he was a guy who had pretty much uh, uh, settled and locked in as the Reds' closer over the last few years. They played around a little bit at the back end of the bullpen. A lot of hard throwers back there, so maybe someone would poach a save here or there, or an opportunity here or there for Iglesias, but Iglesias was pretty much their guy the last few seasons. We go into this year with that Reds' situation being pretty wide open, and I love the pick that you made circling back very late in the draft to grab TJ Antone. This is another guy who our beat reporter for the respective team. See Trent Rosecrans very excited about Antone this season. He was all over Antone last season for what it's worth. And then Antone showed what he could do. Really filthy stuff. A lot of strikeouts last year and feels like the sort of guy who is worth speculating on late in drafts. And I, the, the question I guess here is more about player versus team or player and team combined, how often when you're looking at speculating, are you looking at the player in question period versus the opportunity that could be there with his given team? Especially now when it comes to the later rounds, I personally, in all my drafts this season, I'm going to look for guys that have the talent, that have the skills and just say whatever, you know, the, the old baseball HQ mantra, you know, draft skills, not roles. I think that you know may be more important now than ever, especially when we're talking about relief pitchers and guys who could come in like a Devin Williams and just be lights out and be so good that they have to be put in those high leverage situations. Antone is is one of those guys, and I read Trent stuff uh, very often. He's he's fantastic and he knows his stuff, and and I agree. I mean that's that is a high upside arm in a situation where. Really, there is no closer. And I don't yeah. think, uh, unless Sean Doolittle somehow comes in and becomes the guy and allows David Bell to, to put uh, all those other power arms that he has in specific situations in the sixth inning or, or whenever he needs them, um, I, I think that's going to be a bullpen that's, that's going to have three or four guys get a bunch of saves and nobody ever really take the job. Um, Anton could be that guy. He could possibly be in the starting rotation for all we know. Um, but still high upside, great talent. Um, those are the guys that I, that I really want to stockpile at the, at the back of my roster. Yeah. As you look at the bottom half of your draft, do you have a favorite pick 
from your team and everybody likes the team that they build most most people in our business i think really like their teams <laughs> afterwards i know i do I, I love looking at my own roster and feeling good about myself but is there anybody that really pops for you as a, a good back half of the draft pick that you were able to to lock in here that you think is a good either undervalued player or if it's really really late a legitimate sleeper for 2021 yeah the um the fun thing about these drafts is that especially when we don't have a whole lot of information to to go on is you get to pick the guys that you like and you you pick those fun kinds of guys mm -hmm. for me um and i think i think this guy could be a legitimate sleeper this season that's ty france of the mariners and i got him let's see what like, round 23 so the last of the starters um he may slot in as as my utility or maybe the first guy off the bench but here's a guy that really hasn't had a chance to play regularly in his entire career, but who definitely has the hitting pedigree and the background. Two years ago in El Paso, when he was with the Padres before getting traded to Seattle, minor league stats were ridiculous. You see, and it was in 120 some games uh, and granted the ball was very lively <laughs> at AAA and uh, the stats were inflated a little bit, but he hit, 397 and had you know, 27 home runs, I think. And in just uh, 120, 30 games, I mean, that's legit no matter where you are. I mean, these are still professional pitchers throwing at the AAA level. And he just didn't get a chance there in San Diego. Traded to Seattle. Looks like he slotted as the everyday DH for them this year. Can also play second base can play in the outfield if he needs to. So there's a little bit of position flexibility. He's not a DH only guy. I think Ty France could be a, a fantastic late sleeper. So he, he was, you know, we, we do a, a sleeper and bust. We pick at the end of the, of the labor draft to include in, in the sports weekly issue that comes out the special issue. And we each get one pick for a sleeper and one for a bust. And Ty France, I picked the sleeper on my own team even, which may be the kiss of death, but uh, he's, he's my favorite sleeper so far uh, in 2021 you take a look up and down that Seattle roster too I mean he would really have to go into the tank deep and fast to lose significant playing time early on in the season so while uh, you like having a guy uh, if you're going to trust a guy to be a late round sleeper you like him having the sort of leash that we expect Ty France to have this season uh, anyone else anyone any other picks that you are jealous of any picks you wish you made the non Giancarlo Stanton division <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, as it turned out, I, I was looking for a backup shortstop. And uh, that was the one thing, I guess, um, Corey Seager, you know, getting him in the second round or the third round, I just sort of put that out of my mind mm -hmm. and uh, said, okay, I'm good at shortstop. And then by the time we get to the end of the draft, like, you know what? I hope he doesn't get hurt or I could be in real trouble. Uh, so, I mean, some of those... Some of the, um, the, the, like a Willie Castro or somebody like that, if I could have gotten him or uh, Ahmed Rosario, or even in the last round, I was going to say, all right, I'm going to take Willie Adamas was still on the board. And uh, I said, well, nobody's going to want Willie Adamas in the last round. Ends up, he was taken just, uh, you know, at the start of the round and didn't get back to me. Um, but th among those, you know, guys that I actually really would have liked, I think the one guy that I have my eye on and have, have taken him in a couple of places is Jared Walsh of the Angels. I, I really like what he did at the end of last season, um, improved his plate discipline su significantly. And I think he's getting pushed aside a little bit, especially when the Angels were going to start him, it looked like, in right field for them this year um, before they traded for Dexter Fowler. And that kind of sunk his value say, oh, now, you know, he's not going to supplant Albert Pujols and Shohei Otani has the DH spot wrapped up. So Jared Walsh looked like a great pick, you know, uh, several weeks ago before the Fowler trade. I don't think you need to sleep on him because he can still play some of that outfield if they need him to. You're going to need Shohei Otani and Albert Pujols to stay healthy, to keep him out of the everyday lineup at a position there. So excellent power, um, young guy still a lot of uh, of talent to be developed there so he he was really one of the guys that i wanted to get late that i wasn't able to yeah walsh made some pretty interesting adjustments to his swing in the shortened season fan had a great piece uh, earlier in the winter breaking all that down it really 
it gives you some insight as to how he cut the K rate from where it was when he debuted. And kind of like Ty France, when you look back at what Jared Walsh was doing at every minor league stop, well above league average everywhere. The only time he became a below average contributor offensively was in that big league debut. And that's usually when players take that initial dip, right? Making those, those sorts of adjustments. Uh, real quick, looking earlier in the draft, was there a pick that was made by somebody else that really made you happy because you had no interest in that player <laughs> at the price? I mean, we don't have to call anybody out necessarily, but it's more of a, who are you avoiding early? You know, the, I have a sense of relief. There's a few players that go in the early rounds that I want nothing to do with. And when those guys go before my turn, I'm excited because it means I'm getting somebody else that I actually want. You know, we talked about Zach Plesak a little bit earlier, and, and I think he's one of those guys that I'm, I'm certainly not in on because of the small sample size last year. And the fact that, you know, Francisco Lindor was his shortstop yeah. and is not going to be there in the middle of the diamond anymore. Uh, I think that's going to be, you know, it may not kill uh, Shane Bieber's value, but I think it's going to affect pitchers on down. And I, I picked up even, I even drafted Tristan McKenzie. Um, but still, I'm, I'm really concerned about that Cleveland pitching staff that was so, so good last year. And another thing too, along those lines, they faced only central division teams. And that, there were some easy pickings when you get you know, the Royals and the Tigers and the Pirates and, and all of those teams, and you're able to feast on them. So I think uh, Plesak is one of the guys that I'm fading in particular, just because so many of those factors are stacking up on his, you know, from his great season. He just has to be so good to be profitable where he goes. And he may have a difficult time breaking even. One thing that I saw in his profile that scares me a little bit, he lost velocity last year. He dropped like, a little more than a full mile an hour on the fastball like that generally is not something I want to see in someone whose value is shooting up as much as police acts value has jumped this draft season. Steve, before we let you go, let our listeners know where they can find you on Twitter, where they can read your work and when that sports weekly special that you mentioned is going to hit newsstands. All right. Thanks guys. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Steve a Gardner and uh, always happy to uh, interact with people as, as the season gets going. Uh, and, Thank you for mentioning Sports Weekly, USA Today Sports Weekly fantasy special issue comes out. It goes actually, as we are speaking, it goes to print tonight. So it will Ooh, be on nice. newsstands Monday, February 22nd. It'll have the labor mix draft results in there. It'll have all of our player profiles, updated depth charts. You know, even with the Trevor Rosenthal signing, we're going to have that in there. <laughs> um, and commentary from, from myself and uh, from some guys at Baseball HQ looking at prospects and, and breakouts and all sorts of great stuff like that. So uh, thank you for indulging me with the extended promo here. Uh, but it's, it's a, it, is, it is one of our favorite things to put together uh, in the course of the season. So check that out on newsstands, grocery stores, convenience stores, wherever you can pick up your, uh, your print product. And, uh, and usatoday.com, fantasy.usatoday.com is where you'll find my writing. Awesome. Definitely check all of that out. Print stuff is just fun to have. Like it's, it's getting more difficult to even find it. So, no. uh, and, and there's, there's a rush like kind of behind the scenes to get every possible bit of news in before a deadline. So I'm glad that just about all the big stuff has happened, right? There's not really, I mean, a random spring injury or something is always what you're worried about if you have right. a, a deadline around now, but at least the big signings all mm -hmm. finally happened prior to uh, you guys putting that together. It's a great read. I highly recommend everybody check it out. Steve, thanks a lot for the time today. We really appreciate your insight and looking forward to competing against you in the labor auctions here in the next couple of weeks. Yes, indeed. We have labor coming up, uh, what, the March 6th, 7th, uh, that weekend? Yeah. yeah. So get ready. Uh, I'll be there. It's coming up quick. Be sure to give Steve a follow on Twitter as well. That is going to wrap things up for this episode of the Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Before we go, if you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate anybody who's taking the time to do that. We're also doing a survey for Athletic Podcast listeners trying to learn a little bit more about you. We're going to put a link to that survey in the show description. Basically, we're trying to find ways to serve you with even better shows than we've got to this point. So if you take a few minutes to do that, we would greatly appreciate that as well. For Steve Gardner and Michael Beller, I'm Derek Ben Riper. We are back with you on Tuesday.